All right, everyone, welcome back to our next lecture presentation that will cover Chapter 26. Chapter 26 is the urinary system. And in this chapter, we're going to cover the components of the urinary system, the anatomy of the kidneys, and to go over the processes by which the kidneys are going to excrete nitrogenous wastes. Of course, one of the first things that we need to do when starting a new system is discuss its components. Now, the urinary system only actually has four components. Specifically, we'll find the kidneys, of which there are two, the ureters, of which there are two, the urinary bladder, which is a singular structure, as well as the urethra. As we are including the urethra as a component of the urinary system, the male urinary system will be slightly different from the female urinary system. And I'll take just a little bit of time at the end of this presentation to discuss those differences and what they imply. There really are not that many differences that we need to be aware of, and the urinary system is essentially going to function the same in both males and females. But the urethra in males specifically will belong to both the urinary system and the reproductive system, so that poses a potential difference that we need to take into account. Now the whole idea of the urinary system is to get rid of waste products that can be found in the blood. The kidneys act as a filter and blood that's coming into the kidneys through the renal arteries will get filtered and reabsorbed to separate out the waste byproducts with all of the good components of the blood that will eventually go back into the bloodstream. Those waste products that were filtered from the kidneys are going to end up in the ureter and flowing down to the urinary bladder. This organ will be a reservoir for urine, and the urethra will regulate its release from the urinary bladder. The ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra will serve their major purposes to eliminate urine from the body. But it is the kidney itself that's going to produce the urine, so it is this organ that's going to be the primary component that we are going to discuss in the urinary system. So I've already mentioned that the components of the urinary system include the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. And I have also already mentioned that the ureters will take urine down to the urinary bladder, the urinary bladder will store urine until it's ready to be released, and then the urethra will regulate the release and elimination of the urine that's stored in the urinary bladder. While all three of these structures are extremely important, it is the kidneys that carry out the majority of the functions of the urinary system. Throughout the next two chapters, we're going to talk about how the kidneys regulate our body's acid-base balance, regulate our body's fluid volume homeostasis, and also how the kidneys relate to blood pressure. I said once before that we need to think of the kidneys as filters for the blood. A vast amount of blood is going to be pumped through the kidneys every single minute. And the blood that goes through the kidneys enters with the intention of being filtered and having many of the waste products removed. Excess amounts of ions and nitrogenous wastes are two waste products that the kidneys are going to rid from the body. We're going to break down each of these components, but most of our focus is going to be on the kidneys. So now that we've discussed the components of the urinary system, we're going to give a general overview of the functions that the kidneys offer to the body. I've already just mentioned that the kidney's main role is to excrete waste products. This is one of the most important functions of the kidneys, as nitrogenous wastes are going to be formed as a byproduct of protein metabolism. While the lungs and the digestive system are two means, in fact, of eliminating waste products from the body, Nitrogenous wastes will need to get filtered out of the blood through the urinary system. One other function of the kidneys that we're going to see is that these organs will regulate the ionic composition of the blood. Sodium, potassium, and chloride are all ions whose excretion is controlled in part by the kidneys. We will come to see that the kidneys will actually use this function to facilitate another function, which would be the regulation of blood volume and therefore the regulation of blood pressure we must think back to the concept of osmosis from Anatomy and Physiology 1. When there's more sodium in one compartment compared to another, that's going to pull water because the osmotic pressure in the compartment containing more sodium is higher. So it is through the regulation of our blood's ionic composition that we will also regulate blood volume. And as blood volume is a major regulator of blood pressure, we'll see that blood pressure is also regulated by the kidneys additionally. More so in chapter 27, we're also going to talk about how the kidneys regulate our blood's pH. It's going to do this by either excreting or retaining hydrogen and bicarbonate. These two components will play directly into our bicarbonate carbonic acid buffer system. 
So we will, in fact, touch on this a little bit in chapter 26, but most of this will be covered in chapter 27. We're also going to see that the kidneys will produce certain hormones, and they're also going to regulate how much glucose will remain in the blood after filtration. So hopefully by now we have a general overview of the components of the urinary system and its overall functions. We're going to really kick off this chapter by going over the anatomy of the kidneys, the blood supply inside of the kidneys, and the tubular system that the kidneys contain. So the kidneys are referred to as what we call retroperitoneal. Peritoneal refers to the peritoneum, and retro means behind. This just indicates that the kidneys sit behind the peritoneum and are not necessarily wrapped in this serous membrane. You can see an inferior view of a transverse plane of the abdomen shown right here. And the kidneys are going to be found right here and right here. We hopefully remember that on top of the kidney we'll find the adrenal or suprarenal gland, and this will contain the cortex with the zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis, as well as the medulla that will release catecholamines. This structure belongs to the endocrine system. Now one of the most superficial things that we can notice about the kidney is what's known as the renal hilum. A hilum or hilus of any organ is the location where vessels come in and leave. The lungs will also have a hilus where the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, and the bronchi will enter and leave each lung. Specifically on the kidneys, the renal hilum is going to contain the renal artery, the renal vein, the ureter, as well as nerves and lymphatic vessels. The top three here are going to be the ones that I want you to focus on primarily, as the renal artery is going to supply the kidney with blood, and the renal vein is going to drain the deoxygenated blood that has just been filtered through the kidneys. Naturally, the ureter is also going to be found here in the renal hilum, taking the waste products that were filtered out of the blood down to the urinary bladder. Moving from superficial to deep, the kidneys will be wrapped in several different layers. The kidney will actually have three layers that will serve its own functions in protecting the kidneys and keeping them in the proper locations in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And the most superficial of these layers is known as the renal fascia. This is going to be a connective tissue layer that's going to make sure that the kidney does not move around inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. You can see the renal fascia shown here. Just deep to the renal fascia, we're going to have the adipose capsule. And the adipose capsule is primarily made up of fat and adipose tissue. The purpose of having adipose tissue around the kidneys is to make sure that this organ remains cushioned. You'll see the adipose capsule wrapping around the kidney right here, which will help to protect the kidneys from any potential trauma exerted from the external environment. The deepest of these three layers is the renal capsule, which specifically will wrap around the kidney itself. The renal capsule will be the last connective tissue layer that will lay on top of the renal cortex, which is the first true part of the kidney tissue itself. So this slide will give us a better view of the anatomy of the kidneys. Before we get started on identifying the structures listed on this slide, I want you to be aware that this anatomy of the kidney will be very, very important as we move on to understand the urinary system. I strongly recommend that you have a good grasp on this information before you move to the next topics. Now the last slide showed us that we had three different layers of the kidney, and the most deep of those layers was the renal capsule. You can see the renal capsule wrapping around the kidney, shown here. But just deep to the renal capsule, we're going to have one major region of the kidney known as the renal cortex. That is the outer layer of the kidney, and you can see that is this zone shown right here. All of this tissue wrapping around the outer portion of the kidney refers to the renal cortex. And as we saw with the adrenal gland, the cortex of an organ is going to refer to the outer part. Now one thing that we also saw with the adrenal gland was the adrenal gland had a cortex and it also had a medulla. And in fact here in the kidneys we're also going to have a renal medulla as well. So all of this tissue that can be found in here is going to indicate the renal medulla. I've just drawn this line in here so that you can see the dividing line between the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. These two structures are zones that contain other anatomical parts of the kidneys. The cortex specifically is going to contain lots of blood vessels and also the beginning of the functional unit of the kidney. The kidney's functional unit is referred to as the nephron. And in essence, the nephron is just a very tiny tube that's going to facilitate the filtration of blood through the kidneys. There are roughly about one million nephrons that can be found in each kidney. 
And in just a few slides, we're going to break down the microscopic structure of the nephron. So in the cortex, we've got the nephron as well as blood vessels. But in the medulla, we're going to see some other structures making up the bulk of this zone. Specifically, we're going to find renal pyramids, which can be shown right here in this darker reddish color. And in between the renal pyramids, we're going to find renal columns. And you can see each of these labeled right here. These are the renal columns, and these are the renal pyramids. The renal medulla are going to contain structures known as the collecting ducts, which are going to start the pathway that urine is going to take as it leaves the kidneys. Substances will be brought into the kidneys through the renal artery, which will pass up the renal columns and eventually enter into the nephron. And as the nephron filters out all of the bad substances, they're going to flow into the collecting ducts, which are housed within the renal pyramids. At the tips of each renal pyramid, we're going to have what we refer to as renal papillae. You can see renal papillae shown here, and that simply refers to this portion of the renal pyramids. As the collecting duct passes down into the renal papillae, we're going to change its name into the papillary duct. And from the papillary duct, urine will pour out into the minor calyx. Each renal papillae will dump into a minor calyx, and many different minor calyces will dump into what's known as a major calyx. Oftentimes we will have more than one major calyx, and those will dump into this large region known as the renal pelvis. And then the renal pelvis will take urine down into the urinary, eventually to go and be stored in the urinary bladder. We definitely want to feel comfortable with this pathway of urine drainage through the kidneys. Since the renal cortex and the renal pyramids specifically contain the functional units of the kidneys, these are called collectively the parenchyma, or the functional portion of the kidneys. But we don't want to just write off the renal columns, because they're going to be containing blood vessels that branch off of the renal arteries and the renal veins, and they're going to be taking blood to and from the nephrons. We will see a better depiction of this on the next slide when we'll discuss the blood supply of the kidneys. The last structure on this slide that I want to note are renal lobes. Every renal lobe consists of a renal pyramid and the portion of the renal cortex that can be found superior to it. This terminology will help us as we move forward to discuss all of the blood vessels that can be found in the kidneys. So the first thing that I need to mention about the blood supply of the kidneys is that the kidneys receive a very large amount of blood from the heart. Specifically, between 20 and 25 percent of the body's cardiac output will go to the kidneys. And if we can remember that cardiac output is the volume of blood that passes through the heart every minute, that is a fourth of all of the blood that passes through the entire heart. Thinking back to Anatomy and Physiology 1, we had about 20% of our cardiac output making its way up to the brain. And so therefore, between the brain and the kidneys, we have almost half of the body's blood going to those two organs alone. Now in your lab class, you would have likely discussed the descending abdominal aorta and the two renal arteries that branch off and bring blood out to the kidneys. You can see the renal artery is shown here in red as arteries are, and we'll also have the renal vein, which is going to take deoxygenated blood back into the inferior vena cava. You'll actually see that the blood supply of the kidney is shown right here on the right, and the first component is the renal artery, and the second component is the renal vein. Now you might be somewhat alarmed by looking at this vast amount of vessels that course through the kidneys. While at first glance this might seem a bit challenging, I want to give you a word of encouragement and let you know that the blood supply through the kidneys is almost symmetrical. Let's walk ourselves through this pathway and hopefully you'll see what I mean. So the kidney's blood supply will of course start with the renal artery. The renal arteries will eventually branch into segmental arteries, which will further branch into what are known as interlobar arteries. And you can see the interlobar arteries shown right here coursing through the renal columns. In fact, the blood supply of the kidneys seems to course through the renal columns and actually wrap around the renal pyramids. It is this arrangement that gives us the name interlobar arteries. If you can remember that one renal lobe included the renal pyramid as well as the cortical portion that was found superficial to it, these are going to be the arteries that are in between two renal lobes, hence why we give them their name, the interlobar arteries. So once blood has entered the interlobar arteries, it's going to continue out and eventually become what are known as the arcuate arteries. And the arcuate arteries will arc around each of the ends of the renal pyramids. You can imagine that as the interlobar arteries exit the renal columns and start coursing between the renal medulla and the renal cortex, those are going to be the branches known as the arcuate arteries.
From the arcuate arteries, we're going to branch other arteries into the cortex, and we call those cortical radiate arteries. We get their name because cortical refers to the cortex. So these branches are going to disperse out into the cortex, and they're going to supply blood to the individual nephrons of the kidneys. We're going to move on from the cortical radiate arteries, but in review, we've got the renal artery that comes out here. We've got the segmental arteries that are going to branch off from the renal artery, the interlobar arteries that will course between the renal lobes, and then the arcuate arteries that will form an arc around the renal pyramids. From the arcuate arteries, we're going to have the cortical radiate arteries that radiate into the cortex. Now from the cortical radiate arteries, we're going to branch off afferent arterioles that are going to enter the first capillary bed in the kidneys. The glomerular capillaries, also known as the glomerulus, is going to be the capillary bed that hangs out in close proximity to the nephron, and this is where blood is going to be filtered. The large formed elements in the blood are too large to get filtered out through the glomerulus. So those structures are going to leave the glomerulus through the efferent arteriole and then pass into a second capillary bed known as the peritubular capillaries. And the peritubular capillaries get their name because they're going to be wrapping around the tube of the kidneys, which is the nephrons. The peritubular venules will flow out from here and then we'll be back at cortical radiate veins. Now I realize that the structures between the cortical radiate arteries and the cortical radiate veins I went through fairly quickly but we're actually going to break those structures down on future slides. In terms of the larger blood vessels, these are going to be the ones that are fairly symmetrical. So we'll actually find that the cortical radiate veins will actually course alongside the cortical radiate arteries, and those will flow into arcuate veins, which will course along the arcuate arteries, and then the arcuate veins will flow into the interlobar veins, which of course are going to be found here in the renal columns, and then the interlobar veins are going to make their way into the renal vein, where they can then exit and leave into the inferior vena cava. So aside from the segmental arteries, the blood supply in the kidneys on the outside of the afferent arterioles and the peritubular venules is going to be entirely symmetrical. So I do want you to have a good grasp of this blood supply in and out of the kidneys. We're going to break down these structures a little bit more on future slides. And truly, it is these structures that we're going to spend much more time with during this chapter. I do also want to mention that the kidneys are one of the few organs in the body that only receive sympathetic innervation. No parasympathetic innervation at all makes its way out to the kidneys. And those sympathetic nerves are going to control the blood flow that makes its way through the kidneys. Before we move on to the next slide, I do want to show you the microscopic blood flow of the vessels that can be found in the kidneys. You're going to have your afferent arterial shown here that's going to flow into this capillary bed known as the glomerulus. And then blood in the glomerulus is going to leave through the efferent arterial, which will eventually become the peritubular capillaries. These peritubular capillaries will enter peritubular venules, and then those peritubular venules will leave through the cortical radiate vein. You're going to have your afferent arterial that's going to take blood into the glomerulus. Blood inside of the glomerulus is going to leave through the efferent arterial, and that's going to enter into the peritubular capillaries. These peritubular capillaries are going to wrap around the nephron and leave through the peritubular venules. And it is these peritubular venules that will eventually dump back into the cortical radiate vein that will take blood back into the arcuate vein that sits between the renal cortex and the renal medulla. Now this microscopic circulation is going to make a little bit more sense once we've discussed the structures that make up the nephron. The nephron itself has its own anatomy, and it is in very close proximity to the microscopic blood flow of the kidneys. So we want to make sure that we have the anatomy of the nephron down, and then we're going to see how the nephron and the microscopic blood supply of the kidneys are going to be arranged. So the components and parts of the nephron are listed over here. The first part is going to be what's known as the renal corpuscle. And truly, in terms of the nephron, the glomerular capsule is actually the only part that belongs to this tube. Remember, the glomerulus was part of the blood supply. But the renal corpuscle itself is a collective name for both of these two structures and the way that they sit together. So here, you can see the glomerular capsule wrapping around the glomerulus. This whole structure, including both the glomerular capsule itself as well as the glomerulus, is the renal corpuscle. Now, the glomerular capsule is often given another name. Specifically, we refer to the glomerular capsule as the Bowman's capsule. Now, of course, you can also call this the glomerular capsule, but on my test, I'm going to call this thing the Bowman's capsule. And also, from here on out through this presentation, I'm going to be referring to this glomerular capsule as the Bowman's capsule as well.
So make sure that you pause the video and write this down because Bowman's capsule will not be written on the slides for quite some time. So another way to say this is that the renal corpuscle is made up of the glomerulus with the Bowman's capsule that is wrapped around it. Now inside of the Bowman's capsule, substances are going to be filtered and they're eventually going to enter what's known as the PCT, or the proximal convoluted tubule. We call this the proximal convoluted tubule because it's most proximally located next to the Bowman's capsule and it's also tortuous in its shape, hence why we call it the proximal convoluted tubule. Urine is going to enter the proximal convoluted tubule and eventually make its way down into this structure known as the loop of Henle. We often call this the nephron loop, but once again, I'm going to use the term loop of Henle on the exam. So make sure that you make a mental note of the Bowman's capsule and the loop of Henle. These are the terms that I'm going to be using for these structures from here on out. So this nephron loop is in fact the loop of Henle. And the loop of Henle will actually have a descending limb, which will generally be a lot thinner. And then we're going to have this hairpin turn that will start to ascend, which is going to be a bit thicker than the descending limb. So the loop of Henle itself is going to have a descending limb and an ascending limb. And the ascending limb tends to be a bit thicker than the descending limb. The ascending limb will take substances up into the distal convoluted tubule, which is, of course, at the terminating end of the nephron. This structure is, of course, also tortuous, hence why we call it the distal convoluted tubule. Now, each part of the nephron is going to be important for reabsorbing and secreting certain substances into the lumen of the nephron itself. This nephron is eventually going to dump out into those collecting ducts, which will pass through the renal medulla, eventually turning into papillary ducts, and dumping urine out through the renal papillae into the minor calyx. We're going to break down the functions of the nephron a little bit later, but first and foremost, we want to make sure that we get this anatomy down so that we can discuss the blood supply of the kidney and how it matches up with the nephron itself. So this picture is going to be a nice demonstration of how the kidney's blood supply goes hand in hand with the nephron. So first and foremost, we're going to go ahead and start here with the arcuate artery. The arcuate artery, remember, is passing between the renal cortex and the renal medulla. It's going to pass along the outside, arcing around those renal pyramids. So this is our arcuate artery. And from this, we're going to have branching off our cortical radiate artery. Cortical radiate arteries will radiate out into the cortex, hence where they get their name. Now there's going to be several branches off of the cortical radiate arteries, but they're all in fact the same branches. The main branch off the cortical radiate artery is known as the afferent arterial. Remember, afferent means arrive, so the afferent arterial is going to take substances to this first capillary bed known as the glomerulus. Now you can see here with the cortical radiate artery that there's actually many different branches. All of these are going to branch off afferent arterioles and give rise to many different glomerular capillary beds that will all be associated with their own nephron. So the afferent arterial is going to take blood out to the glomerulus where the first steps of filtration can take place. Blood passing through the glomerulus will be filtered out into the Bowman's capsule, and you can see Bowman's capsule is listed right here, so I definitely want you to know that terminology. Substances are going to be filtered out into the Bowman's capsule, which will then allow substances to flow into the proximal convoluted tubule. The proximal convoluted tubule will take substances down into the loop of Henle. We have a descending limb and an ascending limb, and you can see those structures listed right here. The loop of Henle has its descending limb and its ascending limb. The ascending limb will generally be a little bit thicker, and it's going to take substances into the distal convoluted tubule, which will eventually dump into this structure known as the collecting duct. And you can see on the collecting duct that there will be many different distal convoluted tubules that will dump urine into this structure. The collecting duct will take substances down into the papillary duct, and then through the papillary duct, we're going to dump urine out through the renal papillae and into the minor calyx. Now, in terms of the blood supply, we actually stopped at the glomerulus. The glomerulus filters substances into the nephron, and that's when we started going over the pathway that urine's going to take as it leaves the kidneys. But the glomerulus doesn't actually stop there. The glomerulus specifically is receiving blood from the afferent arterial, and it's losing blood from the efferent arterial. The efferent arterial is going to take substances out and eventually enter into the peritubular capillaries, which will wrap very closely around the nephron. Those peritubular capillaries are eventually going to enter peritubular venules, which will dump back in to the cortical radiate vein. And you can see this cortical radiate vein is running parallel with the cortical radiate artery. 
Those will go in the opposite directions of each other, and this cortical radiate vein will eventually dump into the arcuate vein, which will, of course, be parallel with the arcuate artery as well. These are going to take blood back to the interlobar veins and then out of the kidneys through the renal veins. So if you're getting lost with the blood supply that passes through the kidneys, I encourage you to take another look at this diagram. This will show you the exact order that blood will make its way through these different vessels as it passes through the kidneys. And in the event that you're getting lost through the flow of fluid through the nephron, you'll see down here that we start with the Bowman's capsule. We're eventually going to go into the proximal convoluted tubule. We'll have our descending and ascending loop of Henle. And then we're going to have the distal convoluted tubule that will dump into the collecting duct shown right here. And that is going to eventually dump into the papillary duct, which will leave the kidneys through the renal papillae. Now just a couple other house cleaning terms that I want to mention is we do have the renal capsule that can be found out here and we've also got the cortico-medullary junction which is simply the junction between the cortex and the medulla. So I'm just going to reiterate one more time how important the blood supply and urine flow through the kidneys are. In order for us to do well on this chapter we have to have a good background on the anatomy of this organ. So make sure that you feel comfortable with this blood supply as well as the components of the nephron before moving on. Now a couple other things that I do want to mention on this slide before we go any further is that we're looking at what's known as a cortical nephron. Cortical nephrons are in fact making up the majority of all of the nephrons in the kidneys, between 80 and 85 percent of the nephrons. But we're also going to have a second type of nephron known as the juxtamedullary nephron. And this nephron gets its name because the renal corpuscle itself is found much closer to the renal medulla than the renal corpuscle in the cortical nephron. This difference is based on proximity. The renal corpuscle in a cortical nephron is much further out in the renal cortex, while with a juxtamedullary nephron, the renal corpuscle is going to be much, much further deep in the cortex that's going to be much closer to the medulla. The loop of Henle in our cortical nephrons is generally going to be a little bit shorter. And comparatively to the juxtamedullary nephrons, the loop of Henle is going to be much, much longer and dip much further into the renal medulla. It is these juxtamedullary nephrons that are actually going to have both a thin ascending limb as well as a thick ascending limb. You can see the thin ascending limb shown here and the thick ascending limb shown right here. These juxtamedullary nephrons generally make a much more concentrated urine than the cortical nephrons do. Specifically, we will discuss this later on in this presentation. One last difference that we're going to see with our juxtamedullary nephrons is that there's actually going to be a third capillary bed that's coursing past the loop of Henle. This capillary bed is known as the vasorecta, and I will mention the vasorecta later on in this presentation as well.